may not, I am Jordan Adams, um, the Artist Services Manager here at the Indiana Arts Commission. Um, today we have Elaine Grogan Luttrell um, here with us, and she is going to kick off our webinar for Tax Tips for Artists. Um, Elaine is the founder of Minerva Financial Arts, um, a company that she founded that is devoted to building financial literacy and empowerment in creative individuals like yourselves. Um, she specializes in education and coaching and her workshops um, and presentations have been featured nationally um, for groups that support the arts in a variety of state and regional arts councils and commissions, um, as well as colleges and universities too. So we have her here and she's gonna give us all the tips we need to complete our taxes for this, well, last year. I'll, I'll kick it over to you, Lane. Thank you, Jordan. Yes, all the tips you need. We got it. We got it all covered. And, and hopefully they'll make sort of next year a little bit easier too. Um, hello, everyone. It is so nice to see so many familiar names here. Uh, it is wonderful to have you here. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, and we can dive right in to, to all of this good content. Uh, we're talking taxes, but you probably knew that. Um, and I'd love to start with with an invitation for you to participate in the chat. Uh, I know some of you are still, you know, getting settled and all that, totally fine. But I would love for you to just drop a quick number in the chat. How are you feeling about taxes? Uh, number one, they are the worst. Three is kind of like a meh in the middle. Or number five, you love them and you can't wait for next year because you have already totally done your taxes this year. Uh, drop that quick message in the chat. Seronia gives me a three. I love it. Right in the middle. That's perfect. <laughs> Heather's a three. <laughs> Diane. Diane, you're a one. That's all right, Diane. John's a one, two. Kate, hello. Good to see you is a three coming in right in the middle. Uh, Elijah's a three as well. I'm shocked no one has put number five yet. I, I don't, I can't imagine why you don't all just totally in love taxes. <laughs> Maybe by the end of our uh, tax time, we will we will love them a little more. Although Becky coming in with the number five, you had yours done, you love them and you can't wait for next year. Uh, I love that, Becky. Thank you so much. And it's lovely to have you here, Becky. Uh, Sarah's coming in with a three as well. Thank you. I am. I'm so glad for uh, that little bit of feedback. Uh, hopefully, we will nudge you a little bit closer to the five by the end of our time together. Uh, because our goal tonight is to make navigating tax season a little bit easier, um, especially if you've got that professional. Uh, but even if not, if you're doing them yourself, you know, hopefully this will be an opportunity to answer a lot of your questions and, and make you feel a little bit more confident as you're going through everything. In addition to that, or maybe more specifically to that, uh, we're going to go over kind of the overall federal income tax landscape. We'll talk about some ordinary and necessary business expenses and what's deductible with some examples. And then we'll also talk about record keeping systems so that you can make sure you are staying as organized as humanly possible. As Jordan said, I'm Elaine. I use she, her pronouns, and I am joining you from Dublin, Ohio, which is right outside of Columbus, Ohio, Kashkashkia and Hopewell, indigenous and cultural lands. And I am a CPA, and we are talking about taxes, but I need to say that all of this information is being provided for educational purposes only and is not intended to be tax, legal, or accounting advice. But you probably knew that. Um, I'm also sharing numbers uh, and figures that are relevant for 2022, so know that also some of those numbers change from year to year. So, so next year, the concepts will stay the same, but some of the numbers might change as well. So let's start by kind of answering a big question, how do federal income taxes work? Uh, this is my very simplified visual example of what Form 1040 looks like in the United States, sort of the key parts there without all the extra text. If you are a permanent resident of the United States, if you are a dual citizen of the United States and somewhere else, or if you are, you are a U.S. citizen, Form 1040 is the form you will file each year. If you fall into another category, maybe you're a non-resident or, or someone else, you might have a slightly different form, but a lot of the same concepts are the same. And the IRS has some great guidance on what form you may need to file. Form 1040 starts with 
information about the income you earn throughout the year. And we know in the arts, that can be really complicated because you earn income from a variety of things. So knowing how you earn income generally tells you where that income gets reported on your tax return. And there are some geographical differences on the different schedules and also some rules differences that might you might find helpful to be aware of. So generally folks have wages. So that would be like your W-2 income. You may have business income and you may have other types of income. Maybe you're drawing on social security or maybe you're um, collecting a little bit of random income associated with some hobby you have or something like that, right? There are other types of income that could go in different places as well. Well, let's start with wages. We call this W-2 income. When you are an employee of someone else, they send you a W-2 at the end of the year that tells you how much they paid and how much they withheld in taxes on your behalf. If you are an employee of someone else, they are sharing your tax obligations with you, which is very nice of them. Also required by law, but it's still very nice of them. They are withholding 7.65% of your paycheck to cover Social Security and Medicare, and they are paying an additional 7.65% from their own budget, their own pocket, contributing to your Social Security and Medicare as well. You are still responsible for your own federal, state, and local taxes, and they are withholding those taxes from your paycheck and sending them to the right authority. Your employer has a lot of the infrastructure already to make sure this happens, which is really nice. The other big thing to know about W-2 income, other than the fact that your employer is splitting your Social Security and Medicare taxes with you, is that you are not permitted to claim any deductions associated with that W-2 income. So that means you cannot deduct travel to and from your W-2 job, for example. Or if your W-2 employer asks you to work from home and you buy some extra equipment to enable you to do that, that expense is not deductible. Those types of expenses, when they are associated with your W-2 job, are not deductible because you don't get any deductions related to that income, which is a really big deal. And this often comes up, particularly in the performing arts. I don't know if we have any actors or directors or, or performing artists on the call, but if you are required to be paid as an employee, none of your expenses are deductible, including that agent and manager fee, which can be kind of tough, right? So W-2 job, your employer shares your social security and Medicare taxes with you, which is very nice of them. And you are not permitted to take any deductions against that income. But you probably have other types of income as well. So if you are running a creative business, Income from that creative business is reported probably on Schedule C if you are a sole proprietor or if you are the only owner of an LLC. If you have any other type of business, maybe you have an S corporation or maybe you have an LLC with multiple owners, you're probably going to end up filing Schedule E instead. It's like an alphabet soup here of different schedules, right? Schedule C business income for sole proprietors and single member LLCs, Schedule E for other types of businesses. Generally speaking, Schedule C is a little bit more common, so that's probably the one you're using. If you are running a business, you are essentially the employee and the employer. I know that's not exactly right, right, because you don't pay yourself a salary, but for purposes of self-employment taxes, you do not have an employer to split that tax obligation with, right? You are playing both roles, so you are going to pay 15.3% in Social Security and Medicare taxes, plus federal, state, and local taxes as well. This other half of the Social Security and Medicare that you're responsible for often surprises people.
So the types of income that could be related to your business falls into a lot of different categories. You might have grants or you might have different awards related to your business. You might do different types of freelance projects and you might get 1099s from those different gigs. You might sell work directly to someone, in which case you wouldn't get a tax form necessarily, but you would keep track of those sales. You might run workshops out of your studios and have that type of sales income or event income associated with that. So really all different types of income you have, if it's related to the business you are running, it is reported probably on Schedule C. And you are able to claim business deductions associated with that income. So let's take a moment just to kind of unpack this question, are you running a business? Because believe it or not, this can be a really complicated question to answer. So let's look at the criteria the IRS lays out for whether or not you are running a business. The first and maybe most important criteria or is do you approach the activity you are doing professionally and do you keep books and records? This could look like a lot of different things, but if you're approaching something professionally, you probably have a website, you might have some sort of presence for your business online, you might have some sort of business plan. It can be you know, sort of a loose business plan. It doesn't have to be like a, you know, 45 page document or anything like that, but a general idea of what you do, who your customers are, what you need, kind of what your costs are and what your income is. And that connects with this idea of keeping those books and records. So some sort of way of tracking your income and your expenses associated with the business. And you might have other records as well. Maybe you keep track of customers. Maybe you have a database of your clients or those you have worked with. Maybe you have uh, information on your inventory. So where it has been sold or where it has been shown, right? Those are all books and records associated with your business. But let's talk a little bit more about the income and expense type of books and records, um, because this, this is a habit that may be one you love and it may be one you don't love as well. But the IRS says you can use any system suited to your needs that shows your income and expenses, right? So that's a pretty broad criteria for your own books and records, which is pretty nice. That means you get to think about how you work best and build your system around that rather than being forced into using a system that may not necessarily work for you, right? So we can see very analog systems that are ledger books with, you know, copies of receipts stapled to them at one extreme. And then at the other extreme, we might see a totally digitized software system where a lot of the work is automated. And you might fall somewhere in between. All of those systems are okay as long as they show your income and your expenses for the period. Within all of those systems, you want to make sure you are capturing four key pieces of information. You want to make sure for all of your transactions, so expenses you have or income you earn, you want to make sure you are capturing the date of the transaction the counterparty, so who did you pay, who was the vendor, or who paid you, who was the client, and the amount of the transaction. And these first three things are pretty easy to capture. You can generally get this information on a receipt if it's an expense or on an invoice if you're collecting income or maybe from your point of sale system that will capture the date and the counterparty and the amount for you, right? Usually there's evidence we can gather for these three pieces of information. But that fourth piece of information, the business purpose, is something that you are responsible for proactively documenting, right? So, so let's pretend after this webinar, Jordan and I are going to go out for dinner and we're going to talk about how the webinar went. And I'm going to say, Jordan, I'll pay for dinner. I would really appreciate your feedback on this webinar. The date 
of that transaction, my business meal expense would be March 30th, 2023. The counterparty would be whatever Jordan's favorite restaurant is in Indianapolis. The amount might be like $100 or so, and the business purpose is debrief meeting with Jordan Adams of the Indiana Arts Commission to discuss tax webinar feedback, right? Within that business purpose, I have explained how that expense is connected to my business, right? Because it's also totally possible that Jordan and I could go out as friends just to hang out and catch up. That is not a deductible business expense, right? In fact, it's not even a business expense at all. It feels like a personal dinner expense. So by documenting the business purpose in addition to this extra information, I'm keeping track of my business expenses and all the information I need to capture. And I can do that in a lot of different ways. One option is in some sort of database system. This would be something like Excel or maybe Numbers if you're a Mac user, or something like Google Sheets if you want to do it sort of in an online database system instead of having the Excel software. Google Sheets and Excel and also Numbers, they all pretty much work the same way. And so if you're using a database system, you probably want to either enter all that information or you can export data from your credit card or your bank account. You can delete any data that doesn't need to be in your system. And then you can sort of organize it to add the business purpose of the expense and then also maybe some categories related to the items. Using a database system, if you're comfortable with it, is kind of nice because you can play around with the numbers. There are interesting things you can do. Um, if you get really sophisticated, there are fantastic formulas and, and ways you can make the different spreadsheets talk to each other. Uh, but if all of that feels like too much, that's okay too. You can also just keep really uh, relatively simple lists of the information. There are a bunch of templates out there that you can use, especially if you're feeling comfortable with them. But if you want to just kind of build your own, this is how I would set that up. You can see we've got all the required information here, the date, the counterparty, the amount, and the business purpose of the transaction. And then I've added this column here that says category. This is where I would probably match that to your tax form. So for example, Jordan and I are gonna have dinner tonight. Maybe I'm gonna have uh, lunch tomorrow with a colleague and maybe in two or three weeks, I'm gonna be traveling and I'm gonna have a meal while I'm in travel status. The category for all of those expenses would be business meals, right? So I would have all three of them listed in my system, but then they would all have a common category. So if I wanted to sort the data or add it all up by category, I'd be able to do that. But you also might say, Elaine, I hate Excel. I hate Google Sheets. Uh, that's why I'm an artist. I want nothing to do with any of that. And I will say that's fine too, because there are a ton of different software options that basically are built essentially to be databases to take out some of that manual work, right? QuickBooks tends to be what accountants think of as kind of the gold standard, but there are a lot of other options that work really well as well. Um, FreshBooks is really beautifully designed, very nice to look at. It has a great in, uh, invoicing type of system. So if that's something important to you in your freelance work, FreshBooks could be a really good option. Wave is also fantastic. Wave has this kind of massive cult following of people who like really, really love the software. So there's a lot of built-in support there. You may even know other folks who are already using it. So, so Wave could be a really great option. Wave also has a freemium model. So there is a, a free version of Wave that some people like to start with. And then you might need to grow into the paid version as well, uh, which is perfectly fine. QuickBooks does not have a free version, uh, although QuickIn is another similar product also owned by Intuit. Tends to be for more personal use instead of business use, but sometimes people prefer that kind of layout. 
And Mint is also owned by Intuit. And Mint is not necessarily an accounting system in the same way that QuickBooks is, but it does gather all of your transactions and sort them into categories. So that could be another really good option. Just make sure you are clear on how any of these services are using your data, though. Uh, sometimes people aren't comfortable with Mint sending advertisers their way if, you know, there, there might be good opportunities for them or something like that. Um, or if you say, you know what, Google knows everything about me anyway, you might be really comfortable with that. So that is a choice for you to make, and there are, there are no wrong answers. Um, if there are still questions or, or other systems you're looking at, uh, YNAB stands for You Need a Budget. That is a platform, I think it's about $8 a month uh, that people really like. You have a little less control over the categories and especially on the income side, which sometimes annoys people a little bit. But YNAB is basically built to kind of give every dollar you earn a job and then assign it and budget it out that way. Um, and it's a really cool platform that people like. Uh, and then personal capital is also a really good option. That is one of the more expensive ones, and it, it might do more than you need it to do. So know that there are lots and lots and lots of apps and cloud-based softwares and even sort of physical-based softwares uh, that you can lean into uh, if that's what you would like. You're going to want to choose a system that you like and that you're comfortable using because you want to hang on to your records for a seven year period. And the way we get to seven years is to know or recognize that the default statute of limitations, so the amount of time the IRS has to examine your tax return, is three years. But that could be extended to six years if there is a gross misstatement on your tax return. You may not know if there is a gross misstatement. That basically means a big error on your tax return. So we generally save things for six years just in case. But that six-year period starts on the later of the date you file your tax return or when your tax return is due. So that means you may have had an expense last year, say in January of 2022, your statute of limitations won't start until the tax due date this year, which is April 18th because of some holidays in DC and the weekend. And then your six-year statute starts. So that means you're going to be hanging on to your records until 2029, which sounds impossibly far into the future and will be here before you know it. All of which is to say, have a system, save everything for seven years. And it is possible you don't save receipts. I understand. It's super annoying. I get it. Sometimes I don't always end up with every single receipt either. And we can save receipts and make our best efforts. I love a good big plastic envelope where you can just stick any receipts you happen to get. Uh, that way you've got your system, maybe it's Excel or Google Sheets or Wave or another platform that's capturing all the information you need. And you've got the paper backup just in case, right? The IRS will ask you for your receipts if you are audited. That's why we say go ahead and save them anyway. But it becomes especially important if there's maybe some ambiguity around what you're spending money on. So let's pretend, um, let's pretend you're a performer and you're going to give a performance and you go to Target and you buy like a really nice table and maybe a plant and maybe a little rug. And that's what you're going to use to sort of establish the performance. That's going to be part of your set, right? Those are three purchases from Target. And you're going to have the date and the business purpose, uh, materials for a set, and the amount, right? And the counterparty, Target, right? You're going to have all that information. But the IRS might say, Target, how do we know you didn't buy groceries with that? Which, of course, are a personal expense. So if you have the receipt, it makes it easier to document that, yes, in fact, 
these were pieces you purchased for a set. And it'd be even better if you have an image of yourself performing and you can point, say, this is that house plant that's there or something like that, right? That's why we say, do your best, save receipts. If you're getting them digitally, uh, you can tag them in your inbox, especially if you're using Gmail or running your business through Gmail. Um, you can set up different tags and then at the end of the year, just print to a PDF all of the receipts that are tagged. Um, maybe you tag them as receipt or as you know tax expense or something like that. Uh, I already mentioned a big envelope. I really love that. And do your best, but also don't lose sleep over this, right? We want to make sure your records are complete and in the best possible shape, uh, but, you know, life happens sometimes. My pro tip for you is to set aside a bit of time on some sort of regular basis to keep up with your books and records. Um, I was just speaking with someone earlier who took one day in June, about halfway through the year, and updated everything. And then she took two or three days at the end of December and then into January and finished up her records, right? So for her, that six-month kind of period worked out really well. For other folks I work with, monthly is a good kind of rhythm. Other people like to sort of think around a performance schedule or maybe an arts festival schedule or maybe a teaching schedule if you're also teaching, right? So whatever kind of rhythm works for you is okay with me. There are people who save everything to the end of the year as well. I do it probably a little bit more often than that, but you know, it is your system so you can use it in the way you want. I also really love having a separate bank account or a separate credit card to track business expenses. That makes it really easy to link up those accounts to a system like Wave or QuickBooks so that the data is automatically imported and it doesn't have a lot of extra stuff. Or if you're using Google Sheets, you can just export the data and save yourself the data entry step. Um, this is not required. And I do have folks that say, you know what, that doesn't work for me. I want every everything all in one account. And that is perfectly fine. Just know that you'll have a little bit of extra record keeping. work. So that's the end of kind of the books and records piece. But remember, keeping books and records isn't the only criteria to know if you are actually running a business. The IRS also wants to see that you spend enough time on the activity to make it profitable. So what they're looking for here is, are you regularly conducting this activity or is it sort of an occasional thing, right? If it's occasional, right, it probably doesn't rise to the level of being a business. Um, I was working with a muralist a couple of years ago, and in her first year, she did one mural. And, and that's amazing. She was super excited. But one mural with no other kind of business or creative income probably doesn't rise to the level of running a business. The following year, she had six different murals, and they were generally scheduled during the warmer months when she could complete them, right? Six different murals feels like it's regularly conducting the activity, right? It doesn't have to be full-time. It can be seasonal. That is perfectly fine. But we just want to make sure it's not kind of a very rare occasional thing you're doing. The next criteria they look at is, do you have the knowledge needed to make the business successful? So certainly this is creative knowledge, technique knowledge, but it's also business knowledge around kind of what you need to do. So coming to workshops like this helps demonstrate that you have that knowledge or are building that knowledge. Engaging advisors or tax preparers or bookkeepers also helps as well, right? So being able to kind of demonstrate you have the knowledge needed to make the business successful is helpful if the IRS says, hey, are you running a business? Being able to provide evidence of that is a really good thing. And then lastly, it's always helpful if you are making money from the business you are running. If you're depending on it for your income, if it is your primary or your only source of income, that's even better to establish that you are in fact running a business. 
You don't have to make money from it though. And it doesn't have to be your primary source of income. So if you are attempting to earn income from your business, if you are seeking out new opportunities or applying for different things, that all can be evidence of the fact that you are running a business, even if it is not profitable in every single year. If it is profitable, that's what we're hoping for, right? But we know that's not always possible in the arts. The IRS has a rebuttable presumption that says if you are profitable in three out of every five years, they will assume you are running a business, right? So being able to demonstrate positive net income or profitability in three out of every five years helps. But if you can't, that's okay. That doesn't automatically mean you are not running a business. There's a lot of tax court cases that point to this criteria, right? So if you find yourself in a situation where you haven't been profitable for any number of very reasonable reasons, being able to show evidence of these other things can be helpful in establishing that you are in fact running a business. And if you are running a business, you are reporting business income and also business expenses, probably on Schedule C. If you've already done your taxes for this year and you've got the PDF handy, you might want to flip to it and just see what Schedule C looks like. You'll have your name, your business name, if you have one, the address, and also a code. It says enter code from instructions in box B. And if you go to the instructions, this is asking for your industry classification code. For most independent artists, writers, and performers, the code is 711510, but there are a lot of different codes as well. Uh, there's a special one for photographers, there's a special one for specialized designers. If you are running a retail shop, there's a special code for that. And if you have registered your business with the state, there's a good chance you have already told the state what industry you are operating in. So if you can keep that uh, consistent, that's a good thing. If you are running a business, you are allowed to claim ordinary and necessary business deductions, right? So if I were not running a business and I bought Jordan dinner, that is a personal expense. But if I am running a business, that dinner with a business purpose becomes an ordinary and necessary business deduction, which is nice. A deduction or a deductible expense is an amount that you are permitted to use to reduce your taxable income. So we start with all income from all sources, and then we have a variety of different deductions, so ways of reducing that taxable income. And business deductions are generally allowed if the expense is ordinary, necessary, and effectively connected to your trade or business. So that ordinary word is defined by the IRS to mean common and accepted in your industry. Necessary means helpful and appropriate for your trade or business. And effectively connected means you have some sort of business purpose associated with the expense. So these are the general rules. There are always exceptions and special rules, and we'll talk about them. But I'd love to kind of walk through some common expenses I see among visual, literary, and performing artists, uh, just to give you some ideas of what types of expenses might be deductible. If you are curious about any expenses in particular, go ahead and drop them in the chat and I'll make sure I answer them in real time or make sure we're addressing them through some sort of example for sure. So the first category would be car-related costs or car-related expenses. So let's pretend you drive your personal vehicle to and from an event 10 miles either way where you were paid as a contractor. That's important because remember, expenses for an employee are not deductible. So you're being paid as a contractor for a performance or a gig or something you are doing. You're driving your personal vehicle 10 miles to and from the event. 
You spend $35 to fill up your car with a tank of gas on the way. You use a toll road, so you had to pay $3.85 for a toll, and you had to pay $15 to park. And then you accidentally weren't paying attention to the time. You were in this really, really great conversation, so you ended up getting a parking ticket as well. Do you think these expenses are deductible on Schedule C? Feel free to vote in the chat. You can use an emoji if you want to express yes or no. What do we think? Are these deductible? Sarah says, not the parking ticket. You're right, Sarah. <laughs> Although you would, you maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but you might be surprised sort of how often people try to deduct parking tickets. Diane says, no. The good news is some of these are deductible, right? So if you have business miles driven, there are some expenses deductible there. Yes, yeah, Saronia says yes and no, right? Exactly. Some of these are and some of these aren't. Generally speaking, we use the standard mileage rate multiplied by the number of miles driven, and that's how we claim the deduction for business use of our car. If you are using a car only for business purposes, you might be able to deduct your gas, but in that case, you wouldn't necessarily deduct the miles as well, right? Because that mileage rate covers your gas, your insurance, your maintenance, right? So that rate is meant to cover all of those things. So you wouldn't deduct the gas as well. The toll, the parking fee, that all feels really good and deductible. And of course, the parking ticket is not deductible. We do not incentivize illegal behavior through the tax code. All of these car and truck expenses are deductible on Schedule C on Line 9. Um, generally speaking, as I mentioned, we use the uh, standard IRS rate for business miles driven. And to track those business miles, the IRS wants you to have a written log. That can be a Google Sheet or an Excel Sheet. It can be a little notebook you keep in your car, or it can be an app. QuickBooks has a mile tracking app if you're using that software. There's also an app called Mile IQ that tracks your business trips and puts together a little report for you at the end of the year. The only extra piece of advice I would share if you're using an app, make sure you're getting the data off the app somehow because you want to make sure you are saving it in your own records in case the app doesn't exist far off into the future, right? You want to make sure you are exporting the data or creating a PDF or taking screen grabs if, if that's the only option. That standard mileage rate is updated once a year-ish, although in 2022, it was updated in the middle of the year in part because gas prices and inflation was so high in the middle of the year. So for 2022, you'll have to do an extra bit of math for the calculation, uh, but that's why uh, the the mileage rate is presented there with two different ones. Uh, Diane says, uh, I can't claim miles for dropping off, picking up a painting or going to an opening. Oh no, Diane, you absolutely can. Those definitely feel like deductible business miles. Um, that feels like driving to and from the event, dropping off or picking up a painting. Yeah, that's definitely deductible business miles, right? Because that's related to your creative practice. So yes, those are deductible. You can. Sorry for the confusion there. The next kind of big question is about travel costs. So mileage as you're driving around town or dropping off something or going to an event, right? We consider that like local transportation or local car and truck expenses. But if you're going somewhere that requires an overnight stay, we definitely want to make sure we're capturing the travel costs related to that. So here are some examples. Let's pretend you're participating in an event. So you fly to get to that event and then you have some extra fees. You have to check your luggage. You pay to upgrade your seat on the plane. You've got lodging. And then while you're there, you're gonna do some events and pay for those types of events. 
all of these feel like deductible expenses to me. So for example, the travel, including the extra fees, that is ordinary and necessary travel expenses. And the primary purpose of this trip is business related. So that means you're on pretty solid ground to deduct your travel to and from the destination. Lodging while you're there is generally deductible. And I probably wouldn't deduct the personal sightseeing expense, but if you have a fee to see an exhibition or to do something related to your business while you're there, I would be comfortable deducting that. I wouldn't call it travel expenses because it's not necessarily travel, but it is probably falling into that research category. Your travel expenses live on line 24 of Schedule C. And again, this these are deductible if the primary purpose of the trip is business related. So that's something you're going to want to document. It's also worth pointing out that there are per DM rates um, on a website called gsa.gov. Some folks um, find the GSA per diem rates are higher than their actual expenses for traveling. So if you want to deduct the per diem rates instead of your actual expenses, that's okay. That's an either or choice. So you would take the one that's that's bigger. Becky says travel to out-of-state workshops, absolutely deductible, Becky. Yep, that definitely feels like the primary purpose is business related for sure. In fact, you may also find yourself traveling to an out-of-country workshop or an out-of-country residency, which is also deductible. If you have international travel, the IRS will want to sort of scrutinize that probably a little bit more to make sure that, again, it was sort of a legitimate business trip as opposed to a dream vacation that you just tried to stick some business stuff into. But if the primary purpose is business-related, you're on pretty solid ground there. Now let's talk about food. Uh, you heard my example earlier about dinner with Jordan being a business meal. So you know that some meals are going to be deductible, right? So we have a couple of examples here. We have meals while you are out of town with the primary purpose being business related. We have business lunches or business meals where there is a business purpose. We have an outing with a friend that, you know, maybe is on the business trip, but not necessarily business related. And then we have an example where, you know, you've traveled, you've been to that out of town event, you come back home, you want to go straight to your studio and you order DoorDash while you're back home. Like many of the other examples, some of these are deductible and some of them aren't, right? So for those meals while you are in travel status, those are generally deductible. You are away from your home for a business purpose and you have to eat while you are away from your home. So those are generally deductible. Business meals you have with others where there is a business purpose are generally deductible as well. A personal outing, not so much deductible, right? That is That definitely feels personal, even if it's happening in conjunction with a business trip. And simply ordering DoorDash to your studio does not a business meal make, right? Just because you're kind of working through something doesn't mean that's enough to be a deductible business meal, right? Now, you might say, you know what, I'm still going to pay for it from my business account. I'm just not going to deduct it. And that's okay, too. You'll also see I've noted over here, in addition to indicating kind of which of these are deductible, there is a 50% limitation on deducting meals, right? Even though these meals are ordinary and necessary, they are still only 50% deductible. Now, there was a special rule in 2020 and in 2021 that said you could deduct 100% of your business meals if they took place in a restaurant. That was special pandemic relief legislation that was enacted 
as an incentive to help out our friends in the hospitality industry, right? That was very specific pandemic relief tax law, right? That allowed 100% of meals to be deducted in those years. That was not extended for 2022. And I haven't heard any sort of rumblings that it's going to be extended again or for any other years. I know there's interest in that um, and it would be very nice, but Congress has a lot to do right now. So that's not top of their mind. Here's where you would put your meals, right? Um, your deductible meals go under line 24B on your tax return, right? And again, you want to make sure you're documenting that business purpose of the meal. Two quick questions in the chat that I want to make sure to go back to. Uh, Diane says, what about attending openings? Attending openings does feel like the primary purpose of a trip to go to an opening would be business related. So that definitely feels deductible to me. If it's attending an opening around town and you're getting yourself driving to and from the event and maybe parking there, that feels like it would be deductible as business miles driven. So, so yeah, I think I think you're good there. Serona asked for clarification. The business meal with another person is 100% deductible or 50% deductible? Serona, that is 50% deductible. So that dinner in my example, me and Jordan going to have dinner for $100, $50 is deductible. And that doesn't it matter if it's two people at the meal or like 25 people at the meal, right? It is a 50%, 50% limitation. This 100% is for the meals that um, uh, were deductible uh, under that um, uh, pandemic relief legislation. And actually, thank you for sort of calling that out because I thought that was in 2020 and 2021, but thank goodness I'm keeping notes here. That was actually 2021 and 2022. So that means your business meals would be hundred percent deductible in 2022. It's just for 2023 that we go back to that 50% limitation. Saronia, thank you so much for, for clarifying that because um, I got my years mixed up. There's also a question in the chat um, from someone who said they, they missed a little bit. Uh, will we be able to get the recording? Yes, absolutely. This is being recorded and any attendees will receive a link to the recording and a copy of the slides afterwards, probably in the next couple of days or so. So yeah, no worries at all. Question from Danny. Danny says, uh, Danny runs a pop-up art gallery in which he sells others' art and also his own art. Is it fine for me to couple these two or is selling others' work too different from selling your own? Danny, I feel like it's okay to couple them. The, the one time I might separate it out um, is if you are also selling your own work through other channels that are not related to the gallery. And that might feel like a little bit of a distinction without a difference, but if the business you are running is the gallery and all the sales for other people and your own work run through that gallery, I would keep that all as one business activity. Uh, but if you also have other gallery representation or, or you have other kind of sales channels, depending on the volume of those, you might want to separate it out. But my default answer feels like combining them into one is probably okay. Great question. Now let's talk about equipment. As you're going through your creative process, you might need different types of equipment. Maybe you need a new computer and maybe you're going to use it totally and completely for business purposes and you're going to save your old computer and that's what you're going to use for personal purposes. Maybe you're an illustrator, so you buy a new tablet or a new pen to use only for illustrations, or maybe you're a filmmaker or leaning into educational offerings you're, you're doing or maybe online things and you buy a new camera, right? All of those feel like deductible equipment expenses to me, right? That would be deductible on Schedule C as long as you're running a business. We would report those expenses probably on line 13. This is the line for depreciation and section 179 expense deductions, which is basically equipment you are purchasing. It could be really any type of equipment as long as you're using it for your business purpose. 
and you are uh, documenting kind of the business use of the thing. You may be familiar with the word depreciation. Depreciation just means you spread the cost of the item over multiple years, usually the life of the item. You may choose to depreciate, meaning you take a portion of the expense as a deduction over multiple years, or you are allowed to deduct the entire cost of the equipment in the year you bought it. Most folks prefer to do that simply because that's when they spent the money. So that's when they would really like to have the tax deduction for that money they spent. If you want to do that, that is totally fine. You may also prefer to spread the deduction over time. Um, maybe, for example, you don't, if you claim a deduction, that might push you into a loss for that particular tax year. And maybe you want to spread the cost over time so that you don't necessarily show a loss. That is all okay and, and well and good. You kind of get to decide what makes the most sense for you and your business. But as I mentioned, most folks end up preferring to deduct the entire cost in the year they purchase the equipment. And you also might need to maintain that equipment. Maybe you have service costs or repairs or anything like that. Those types of costs are deductible as well. Line 21 has repairs and maintenance, right? So maybe you're a musician and uh, you purchased an instrument a few years ago and you have regular maintenance costs related to the instrument, right? Those types of things would be deductible on line 21. It's also possible that you decide to rent equipment instead of purchasing it. And that's okay too. Your rental expenses are deductible, but they're deductible in a different place. Line 20 here has rent or lease of vehicles, machinery, and equipment or other business property. So maybe you are a muralist and you rent a special lift in order to get yourself high enough to complete the mural. Renting that lift feels like equipment rental. Or maybe you're a visual artist, you're going to an event in another state and you have to rent a large van so that you can bring all of your artwork to that other state. That would be renting a vehicle and the entirety of that cost would be deductible to you. So as we're thinking about different types of equipment you might need, it's okay to rent it if that makes sense or to purchase it. In both cases, it's deductible. Renting other business property could be like if you're renting a studio space for yourself, or maybe you are renting a co-working space if you like to work out of a shared space regularly, or maybe you're renting a storage unit if you, you have a particular volume of artwork that you need to store, right? Those would be examples of other business property you might rent. I will say as well, if you rent your home, it is possible to deduct a portion of your rental expenses for your home and all other types of home expenses as well, but we never put those on this rental expense line. Anytime we're thinking about deducting a portion of your home costs, that goes on a special line, and we'll get to that line in a few more slides. Sometimes people ask if their clothing is deductible. So maybe you are giving an artist talk or maybe you get something new to wear to that opening you're going to, or maybe you're a performer and you have a specially tailored garment that is only suitable for performances. Or maybe you're a dancer and you buy a lot of different shoes, but you only wear them on Marley or while you're performing. Or maybe you have different type of kind of safety clothing, like goggles or aprons or gloves, right, that you're using in your studio. Those are all different examples of attire you might have. And other than the first one, those types of clothing expenses are generally deductible, right? So if you have a specially tailored garment that would not be suitable for everyday wear, that's probably deductible. Shoes that you're only performing in, same thing, and safety equipment, generally deductible. 
But if you are purchasing something that is suitable for everyday wear, even if you never would wear that thing, right, it is not necessarily deductible, right? So that is a personal expense and it is not deductible. So apologies for that. If you rent a garment, that could be a good option instead uh, because your rental expense would be deductible because you're not purchasing the garment, you're simply renting it and then returning it. So it's not available for everyday use. Uh, but generally speaking, regular garments uh, are not deductible. If you do have equipment or attire in those special categories, um, I'd probably put them in this other expense category. This is the part where you can list out your own categories if something doesn't really fit well in another category. Uh, so other expenses is probably where I would put any sort of specially tailored performance attire or any safety equipment. Um, you might also have safety equipment included on line 18 for office expenses. If you think about it as kind of an expense associated with the place you work, it, that's probably okay. We saw a lot of people putting um, masks and like hand sanitizer and things like that in office expenses. That's probably okay. So if that feels like a better spot for it, that's okay. Just be consistent from year to year, right? And the same thing is true for Carrie Beth's question in the chat. Carrie Beth says, apps she's using or, or cloud backup services she's capturing under dues and subscriptions, probably in this other expenses category, since there's not another line for that. And that is totally fine. And, and usually software and subscriptions is the verbiage I tend to use, but dues and subscriptions is also perfectly fine. Um, so that would be any of the software programs you use, cloud backup services, um, any apps, maybe Zoom, maybe Linktree, other things like that, uh, totally, totally deductible as subscriptions. Adobe, for sure, uh, if you're a visual artist and that comes up for you. Um, so yeah, totally fine. Dues and subscription is really good. And just be consistent from year to year. Now let's talk about research because as part of your creative practice, you probably have different types of research that you do. So, so let's talk about what it looks like to have some research deductible. Uh, this first example is, you know, someone going to different events. Maybe they're going to exhibitions, maybe they're going to different performances or shows, right? If there is a business purpose associated with that, that feels like it could be deductible. Or maybe you subscribe to different streaming services. Maybe you are an animator and you make sure to subscribe to Netflix because uh, you're pitching something to them and you want to make sure you are current on what is happening in animation world, right? Maybe you buy books on topics that are connected to your body of work or connected to something you're exploring, or maybe you purchase uh, business-related books or you know, books associated with being an artist or a creative entrepreneur. And then the last example is that uh, you attend sporting events because one day you'd really like to do some sort of something in sports. Those first three examples are generally deductible. We want to be careful and make sure we have a legitimate business purpose for them because it is easy to abuse this research category, especially when it comes to going to events, attending events, purchasing tickets for things, right? The IRS is going to say, really, is all of that business related? Uh, but if you have a legitimate uh, business expense, that is definitely deductible. This last one is here um, because of one of my favorite writers who once asked me the question, could he deduct his season tickets to the Yankees because he always dreamed about writing a play about the Yankees? And the answer is no, right? You can't just dream about doing something. It has to be a little bit more closely connected to 
income you're earning, right? It doesn't have to always result in income, right? Maybe you go to uh, an event where you're planning to meet a director and you're hoping to collaborate with them, but it doesn't come to fruition. That's okay, right? Not every expense leads to income, but deducting season tickets because one day you want to write a play about a sports team feels a little too ambitious there, right? Now, if someone had commissioned him to write a play about the Yankees, and if he had then maybe gone to two or three games, sat in different places, taken reference photos, maybe recorded some audio, captured notes, all of that then goes into the research, right? Some sort of research folder he's keeping for that project that starts to feel like more legitimate research rather than just going to something because you enjoy it. Research is another one of those expenses that lives in this other income category because it doesn't necessarily fit really well somewhere else. And this is definitely a category where you want to make sure you are documenting the business purpose very, very clearly. And again, you can do that in a lot of different systems in whatever way works for you, but you do want to make sure you are documenting the business purpose. So anything you can do to demonstrate that it is legitimate research is a very good thing. Another question from Carrie Beth, um, the category hard backer board and the clear plastic bags that prints or reproductions go into and the bags that customer shopping bags and tissue paper go into. That's a really good question. Um, let me flip back to our Schedule C picture because that to me, I would probably put in supplies. I know we often use that just for sort of creative supplies, but the backer board, the plastic sleeves, the bags for customers, tissue paper, maybe, you know, if you're a jeweler, you buy those cute little tissue bags, right? That the jewelry from Etsy always comes in. I would put those types of things probably under supplies uh, if it were me. It is also possible to, to put a different category, maybe sort of retail expenses. You could put them if you wanted to keep them in other, but supplies feels like a good spot for that. Um, let me know if that sounds okay to you, Carrie Beth, um, or, or if there's another, another part of that question we can dive into. Occasionally, you might be asked to donate work, and I say occasionally because we dream of that being occasional, but you know, that, that happens pretty regularly. So let's pretend you're a visual artist and you are asked to donate a painting to a charity's auction. The cost of your materials is $175. You would have sold the painting for $1,000 if you were selling it, but the charity ended up selling it for $1,800 to the ultimate buyer. The question here is what is deductible? What is the amount? I'll let you put your answer in the chat. This is one I'm gonna make you answer uh, just to kind of think through the options. Heather says the material cost, so that 175. Meg says 175. Sounds like you all have been asked to deduct work and you already know the answer to this question. Carrie Beth says 175, Maria 175. Yep, you are all exactly right. You may deduct $175 only, just the cost of the materials. Maybe you're a writer and you have copies of a book uh, that you have written. You can buy them for $6 each through your publisher, but they retail for $19. And the community center is like, would you donate five copies of your book to us? Which amount is deductible? You all probably know this, right? But the answer is $30. Just like Carrie Beth said, Wait, well done, Carrie Beth, $6 times five copies. You are allowed to deduct the cost, not the fair value, not the retail price, not even the actual auction price. Last example, let's see how we do on a services one. Let's pretend you were asked to perform for a charity event. Normally you would charge $2,500 for a performance and you have $350 in travel costs. 
are you permitted to deduct $2,500 for the performance since that would have been your normal service fee? What do you think? I'm watching the chat. I'm not seeing answers yet. Should I just tell you? I really do want you to put a number or a yes or no in the chat. For a services, oh, Kate says only travel. Saronia says only travel. Uh, Carrie Beth says only travel. Exactly. Yep. You may only deduct your actual expenses, the $350. Even if you are providing services and even if someone normally would have paid for those services, services are not deductible. So if you give a pro bono workshop, if you give a pro bono performance, if you do something really nice for someone else, your services are not deductible, unfortunately. Uh, your travel costs are, if you have those, right? Those are ordinary and necessary business expenses, but uh, your, your service expense is not deductible. Meg has a brilliant question in the chat. Meg says, is it true that if someone buys my painting and then turns around and donates it, they can deduct the full cost? Yes, that is true, Meg. And I am really, really sorry about that. And the difference is they purchased the work for $1,800 or whatever the amount was. It is not their work they created. Because essentially for them, the cost of what, the, so their cost in the thing is the amount they spent it on. Kind of like your costs on the painting would be $175, right? So if we think about kind of the logic behind this only donate expense kind of rule, your services are what take the value of the painting from $175 for materials to thousand dollars or eighteen hundred dollars those are your services blood sweat tears toils years of experience right that add value to those materials and services are not deductible but if someone doesn't have any services they just buy the thing and then donate it right they get the full cost deduction since they don't have services they just have costs their costs just happen to be more it's a bummer. It's weird. And, you know, there are lots of reasons why we can talk about how stupid that is. Uh, but that remains the tax law currently, with my apologies. Now let's talk about your home. Business use of your home comes up all the time, and it is generally deductible, but there are some very, very special rules. So we have three examples here. Two of them are deductible and one is not. The first one says you have a separate room of your house. You only use it as a studio. It's 100 square feet. Your total home is 1,000 square feet. That's example one. Then you have a separate room of your house. You use it as a studio, but you also teach from that home studio each week. That's example two. Third example, you and your partner share an office in your home. The partner uses half the space for their work. You use the other half. The whole office is 80 square feet and your apartment is a thousand square feet. Two of these are deductible and it's the first one and the third one. In the first case, we take the percentage, hundred square feet divided by a thousand square feet. That's 10% of the overall home space. So 10% of your home related expenses are deductible because the space is used exclusively and regularly for your business. The second one is not deductible because of that rule we talked about earlier, where if you have expenses for a W-2 job, those expenses are not deductible, right? So if you are an adjunct instructor at a local college, you are paid as a W-2 employee. So that means even if you are asked to teach from home, even if you voluntarily teach from home, right? Teaching out of your home studio means your home studio is not exclusively used for your business purpose. It's also used for a W-2 job, which means it is not deductible. So you wanna be careful about that. And then lastly, you may share the office with your partner, that is totally fine, but you can't deduct your partner's portion of the office, right? So in this case, 
80 square feet is the office space. You use half of that. So you're using 40 square feet out of a thousand square feet. So you would be deducting 4% of the costs of your home. But remember, those costs are all reported on a very special line on Schedule C. This is expenses for business use of your home. So if you have sort of a rental expense for your apartment, right, you may deduct a percentage of rent, but it has to be on this business use of home line. You can also deduct a portion of your utilities, right? But even though there's a line for utilities on Schedule C, if it's using your home utilities, we want to make sure those are included in this business use of your home deduction. And that's because this is a deduction that gets a lot of extra scrutiny from the IRS because it's really easy for people to kind of mess up this deduction, right? Because there are some really specific rules. Your home office or home studio or the business use of your home space has to be your principal place of business. You have to also use the space exclusively and regularly for your business, and you can't have any other place where you're conducting administrative tasks related to the business. So that exclusive part makes this a challenging deduction to claim accurately, which is why it lives on its own line and why it gets extra scrutiny from the IRS if someone claims it. Elijah has a question in the chat. Elijah says, I use my living room walls as my gallery. I bring collectors over and show them the art on the wall and it sells from there. Is any of the space deductible for that reason? It's a good question, Elijah. Because it's your living room, I'm assuming it's not also your studio. Um, it's also, it's it's just the wall, right? In which case it feels like no. I think I could get to a place where if you had special like gallery lighting, maybe you deduct the lighting. That's not business use of your home. That's just like lighting equipment you have installed to display the work. So I could probably, I could probably get there on lighting. Um, but, oh good, you do have some lighting, right? So, you know, the year you bought those lightings or the new bulbs or whatever, that probably would be uh, an expense but not for kind of the, the living room area where you're bringing people to see the work. Um, feels like an effective sales strategy, um, but not necessarily a deduction as business use of your home. Um, Maria has sort of a slight variation on that where Maria's living room, right, is not only a place to show work to others, right, and a living room, but it's also Maria's studio. So what I would say, Maria, is yes, a portion of that is probably deductible, but it kind of hinges on this exclusive use. So what you would want to do is kind of identify the space within your living room that is exclusively used as a studio. And forgive me, Maria, I don't remember your creative discipline, but if you're like an illustrator that does digital illustrations on a tablet on your couch, you're probably not going to get there, right? Because tablet on your couch kind of studio isn't going to meet that exclusive use test. But if you're a painter and within your living room, you've got like a corner where your easels are and you've got like a bookshelf for supplies and, you know, a different, it's sort of a, an area that feels different, that feels exclusively used for painting. I'm comfortable measuring out kind of that space. It wouldn't be the whole room, but it would be that portion of the room and then calculating the percentage overall. Carrie Beth says, Carrie Beth works full-time as an artist. Your studio is a third of your house. Um, I miss the percentage that's deductible. I've never taken this deduction. Carrie, if a third of your home is exclusively and regularly used, then I would deduct a third of your costs, right? So, so your portion is 33% of your overall space. So you would deduct 33% of your mortgage or your rental expenses, uh, your utilities, your Wi-Fi, perhaps, uh, insurance, which could be lumped in with your mortgage. So your percentage would be 33%. The percentage isn't automatic. It's just based on the area of your home that is exclusively and regularly used. The other thing about this deduction is this deduction cannot push you into a loss. 
So let's pretend, Carrie, you work full time as an artist, you make $50,000 and you have $48,000 in business expenses. Your net income from your business is $2,000. If the business use of your home is more than $2,000, that would push you into a loss. So you would not be able to claim that particular deduction. Uh, that is a, a special, special rule, which again is why it gets a lot of extra scrutiny. Oh, and Maria, you are a painter and you use half of it to for easels and walls and all of that. Yeah. So what I would do is I would take some photographs of that space when it is looking its most professional, right? And then I would make sure you're kind of documenting the floor plan, kind of showing the space that is exclusively and regularly used, and then calculating the percentage as half of your living room overall your, your entire home. Seronia has a basement furnace room where your jewelry bench and another workbench is for creating uh, jewelry. Seronia, that's awesome. Um, you don't say if it's finished or not, it doesn't matter. But when you're thinking about the total square footage of your home, usually that only includes the finished area. So let's pretend um, it's an unfinished basement, but that's where you work, right? So you would measure and add up that square feet. Let's say it's a hundred square feet of unfinished space in your basement. And let's say your home is a thousand square feet. But the thousand square feet doesn't include that unfinished portion. What we would do is add the unfinished portion to the total square footage, right? So your calculation would be 100 divided by 1,100, right? So we want the portion that's exclusively business use over the entirety of the space, livable, and in your case, counting the unfinished area, if it is unfinished. All right. What other deductions are you curious about? I love the questions that have come through. I think I've gotten them all. I don't think I've missed any. Um, but if there are other deductions you are curious about, now, now is the time. What's on your mind? If you think of something, don't hesitate to put it in the chat. I'll make sure to get to it. Oh, and Saroni says the furnished room is unfinished, and then the rest of the basement is partially finished. So you would include the entirety of the finished and unfinished portion of the basement in that denominator of your calculation. It's like a throwback to, to third grade math, right? But you would have furnace room area divided by livable space plus furnished room. Great, great clarification. I want to take a moment to remind you about self-employment tax, because this often surprises people, right? If you are running a business, you get to take those business deductions that are ordinary and necessary, which is awesome. And you get to pay self-employment tax. It's 15.3% and it is essentially your contribution to social security and Medicare. So let's pretend you're an artist, you earn $50,000 during the year, you've got 15,000 of ordinary and necessary business deductions. So that means your net business income is 35,000. Your self-employment tax on that is $5,355. That's the percentage, 15.3% times your net business income. And this often surprises people because that's a big number, right? Especially on, you know, $35,000 of net income. This is a big number. So don't forget about self-employment tax that will come up as part of your tax calculations. After you've deducted all of your business expenses, if you're running a business, there are some extra, essentially personal expenses that you are permitted to deduct. And the first one is half of that self-employment tax. It feels like such a circular calculation, but you are permitted to deduct half of your self-employment tax as an adjustment to income. So that person who had $5,355 in self-employment tax, they get a deduction of $2,677. They still have to pay the entire amount, but this deduction reduces the income tax they pay. You pay self-employment tax, and then the fact that you paid that reduces the taxable income on which you pay federal income tax. 
it's very circular, but it makes you feel a little bit better about that self-employment tax you're paying. The other personal expense that can be a deductible adjustment to income are any retirement contributions. So if you are making contributions to a traditional IRA, or maybe you have set up a solo 401k for your business or another type of retirement plan, those contributions are deductible to you on schedule one. If you're making a Roth IRA contribution, that is not deductible. For a Roth contribution, you are essentially paying taxes on those dollars right now, but they're tax-free when you take them out in retirement. For a traditional IRA, you get the tax deduction now, but you do have to pay taxes when you take the distribution in retirement. So that is a, a timing issue. There are also some extra deductions everyone gets as well. So we've had business expenses, we've had adjustments to income, a couple of those special things that are deductible. You also have something called a standard deduction. Every taxpayer in the United States gets this. This is tied to your filing status, and this reduces your overall taxable income. It doesn't reduce your business income, but it does reduce your taxable income, which is really nice. You may have also heard about something called itemizing your deductions. If you choose to itemize your deductions, you would basically look at the different things that are listed on Schedule A. State and local taxes are on here, although that's capped at $10,000. Interest on your home mortgage is on here, and charitable contributions are on here as well. Also, medical expenses are on Schedule A if they exceed a certain threshold. So as you're looking at this list of things, if you had expenses in these categories that added up to more than your standard deduction during the year, you would choose to itemize your deductions. Why? Because that's a bigger deduction. You choose either the standard or itemized deductions, whichever number is bigger, because that reduces your taxable income. And you still get business deductions separately from that. Because remember, your business deductions are captured over here on Schedule C. Standard or itemized is an either or choice. And if you are running a business, you may claim business deductions as well. Takesha has a question in the chat. Takesha has instruments um, that they use for sound healing sessions, but also sell instruments, meaning you could resell what you use. So how do you make deductions? That's a really good question, Takesha. Um, I would say um, that's a really good question. Half of my brain is saying they're your inventory, right? So you would deduct them when you sell them. But the other half of my brain says, if you're using one or two of them and you're not planning to sell them, I would deduct those one or two as supplies, right? Um, if you know you're always going to be able to resell it, I would probably wait and deduct it when you sell the instrument because then it becomes a cost of goods sold. Um, Oh, same thing. Even if you're a wholesaler, um, you know, if you're using them in your practice, when you um, when you sell the instrument to to someone else, that's when you would be able to deduct it. If you ever do any giveaways, I don't know that that would come up in your particular work, but maybe you have a couple of instruments and you do a giveaway, um, you would deduct the cost of any giveaways you have. Um, so part of me is kind of thinking, well, if you're using them in your, your business, the service side of your business, the healing sessions, you know, maybe it's more like a giveaway, right? But if you know you'll always still be able to sell it, um, then I would wait until you actually do sell it. Great question, Keisha. Let's talk about how you calculate tax. When you have your taxable income, then you calculate the total tax on that. We've already done self-employment tax, remember, but this would be your total tax for income purposes. And we have a progressive tax rate system in the United States, which means as your income goes up, so does your tax rate. So back to our example, this person, um, the $35,000 of net business income they had, they get the deduction for half of their self-employment tax. Maybe they make a $3,000 IRA contribution for the year. 
and they get the standard deduction. That means their taxable income is $16,373. So of that $16,373, the first $10,275 is taxed at 10%. So that's $1,028 in tax. And then the next $6,098 is taxed at 12%. So that's another $732. So that means their federal income tax is $1,760. That gets added to that self-employment tax. And if they live in a state or a city that imposes tax as well, it also gets added to that tax. So their total taxes, these state and city numbers are just estimated, may end up being $8,261. We compare that total tax to what they paid in during the year, and that's how we figure out what is due, right, if you have to pay more in tax or the refund you are getting. I'm going to pause here because there are two questions um, about inventory. Carrie Beth says, uh, Carrie Beth is lost about taking year end inventory. The accountant always asks. Um, and then Kate says, what about inventory? For example, I buy $1,000 worth of fabric. I dye most of it. The fabric really has no value until it is made into something. Would this be deductible as a supply or does it need to be part of cost of goods sold? Kate, I'm so glad you asked this question. And, and Carrie Beth, this probably connects to what your accountant is asking you as well. So when you have supplies, right, fabric for Kate, right, um, musical instruments for Takesha, right, um, and um, Carrie Beth, I forget what your discipline is, but, you know, supplies, you know, canvases, paints, maybe uh, that, that goes into what you're doing. Yeah, canvases, paints, you know, frames, stretching, all, all that other stuff, right? There are two different ways to deduct your creative supplies. One of them is through cost of goods sold, and we choose that way for something we can count, right? So instruments, you would put in cost of goods sold. Um, if you sell candles, you can count the candles and sell cost of goods sold. Um, if you, let's see, what else? Um, the author, right? You, you have some books, you buy some books, then you sell the books. Um, because you can count them, you would deduct cost of goods sold. And that's where taking inventory at the end of the year is pretty easy, right? Because you just count up how many things you have left, you know, books, musical instruments, t-shirts, um, prints that you have produced in mass, maybe something like that. Um, and you can just deduct whatever you have sold during the year. There's a formula for doing that on Schedule C. It starts with you kind of estimating what you have at the beginning of the year, adding in whatever you purchased during the year, including supplies if you're going to use cost of goods sold, and then subtracting what is uh, left at the end of the year. So that's how we kind of back into cost of goods sold. So what the accountant is asking is, okay, what's that end of year inventory number? For Kate's question, right, if you buy $1,000 worth of fabric and you dye it, right, that feels like it's not necessarily easy to count. Someone might argue, yes, I can count. I can measure the yardage, right, and all of that, right? But for something that's not easy to count, and paint might go into this category as well, right, I think there's a strong argument to just deduct your supplies, right? Especially if we're talking about a thousand dollars worth of fabric. Kate, if you start buying like a million dollars worth of fabric, we might need to invest in like a more robust kind of management system. But for a thousand dollars of fabric, that feels like I would probably just deduct it as a supply and not worry about inventory. Now, a lot of crafters, um, and uh, I think, is it Takesha is a jewelry? No, Takesha is the sound artist. Uh, Saronia is the, the jewelry maker. A lot of jewelry makers will feel comfortable counting inventory. Um, some crafters feel really comfortable counting inventory at all. You know, you're counting um, the yarn you have or, or the different supplies. Um, I've also worked with a lot of jewelers who say, there is no way I'm going to count how many beads I have. <laughs> that is a colossal waste of my time. I'm just going to deduct my supplies as an expense in that year. So it is an either or choice. Terry Beth, for your accountant, I would say, um, ask them, like, do you want me to do 
inventory or can I just deduct all of my supplies as supplies throughout the year? Um, that feels like a good approach to me. And, and Carrie Best says the reproduction costs are easy, but all those original is all over the place. And yeah, you absolutely can. You can deduct all of your original uh, stuff as supplies. And for the reproduction, since they're easier to count, you can count them and deduct that as cost of goods sold. That is totally and completely fine. In terms of planning, um, my advice always tends to be set aside 30% of everything you earn as a freelancer or a business owner. If you have a W-2 job, you can adjust your W-4 to withhold a little bit of extra. And if you're like Becky or Carrie Beth and you're working with a CPA, you can also ask them for a little bit of help planning or estimating what your tax obligations might be for the coming year. Uh, the IRS has a tool that can help you do that. It takes a while to navigate, so, so don't rush it, right? Give yourself lots of time to do it um, and sort of feel free to use the resources around you. We are coming to the end of our time together. Uh, if my Apple time is correct, we are at 629 Eastern time. Um, here's what we did. I will end with gratitude. If there are any final questions you want to put in the chat, please, please, please feel free to do that. And I'll answer them before we wrap. Uh, but thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for voting on the answers to the questions I pose to you uh, and all of the clarification points as well. I really, really appreciate it. Saronia has a question in the chat. If I deduct supplies and I still have some completed items left, that part under goes under cost of goods sold. Nope. If you are deducting supplies, um, we would just write off. You wouldn't then also use cost of goods sold, right? You would basically then just hang on to the stuff. And when you sell it, there's no extra deduction because you've already deducted the costs. So that's an either or choice. Um, unless you're like Carrie Beth and you have two very distinct products and you can do all expenses for one and then cost of goods for the other. I hope that helps. Oh, uh, there's a request for Takesha's website uh, from Elijah. Uh, I love it when, when magic happens here. You all should absolutely connect uh, and do really wonderful things. Um, and thank you for, for all of the really great questions. Um, Oh, Diane says, if I'm still not making a profit, when should you call it quits? Diane, I think your voice and your work in the world is always a good thing. Uh, so for me, I don't think you should ever quit, um, but that's the like heart human in me. Um, it, as a business matter, um, I think that's, that's a different question to answer, uh, but I think you might be the only person that can answer that. But your work is wonderful. So I think it would, the world is a better place for having it in it, even if there's no profit. And then there's one more uh, private question that came. Is there a certain amount of money we need to make before having to pay yourself? No, you can pay yourself whenever you want. I would encourage you to pay yourself if possible. Reinvesting in the business is always amazing. Um, but no, there's no minimum amount that you need to make before you pay yourself. If you're a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, we just call that an owner's draw. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful questions, all of the great things. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening uh, and stay tuned for incredible things from Jordan and the IAC. And it was so lovely to see so many familiar names here tonight. Thanks for being here. I'll see you all soon. Thank you, um, Elaine. Everyone, we will have this um, recording on our YouTube page and we'll send out that link when it's posted. Um, thank you, everyone.